Imagine you are tasked with teaching someone about your profession. It can be any profession, engineering, nursing, dentistry, acting, and it can be for any number of reasons. You might have young students investigating their future career options. Maybe they are in a neighboring profession and are interested in understanding what goes on over there. Or perhaps they are already on their career journey and want to learn more about some important skills that they will be applying. Whatever their motivation, what would be the best way to learn more about your profession? Read it in a book, watch a video, or observe it in person? I'm sure we can all envision times in our own professions when these various scenarios have taken place. And I imagine most of us would agree that the best way to learn about their profession is through direct observation. There are so many tangibles and intangibles that are best understood by being there. The sounds and smells, the pace and intensity, the emotions, and teamwork just to name a few. As a result, career days, tours of workplaces, and clinical observation are common features of most professions. But what if those all had to stop, yet you still had these curious students? How would you adapt? This is what happened to us in radiation therapy, and this is our story. The career of radiation therapy is for many people a complete unknown. Most don't even know it exists, let alone understand what the career entails. This obscurity presents both challenges and opportunities for us. But one thing is for sure, we do a ton of education regarding our career. The majority of our career education is done in person at our skills lab. And it's done either for recruitment purposes, for interprofessional courses, or for modeling skills in radiation therapy courses. Our skills lab is amazing. It is located on site at the Cross Cancer Institute and was designed to simulate the clinical environment to the highest level of fidelity. When the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting health measures came along, we were forced to change the way we taught. Physical distancing requirements limited the number of students in the skills lab to five at a time, with interprofessional class sizes reaching 85, in person just wasn't a feasible option. On top of that, even if we wanted to continue in person, the Cross Cancer Institute had enacted visitor restrictions, which severely limited our access. The clinical environment reproduced at the skills lab is impressive. The impression that being there in person makes cannot be underestimated. We needed and wanted to respond to remote teaching demands while providing as much of the in-person experience as possible. But how do we adjust for the limited access to the skills lab? And how do we present an experience for others who often have no frame of reference that captures the significant visceral impact of the clinical environment? Our answer, VR immersive video. Now I want to play for you a short trailer video that we hope will give you an idea of what we are doing. It is a shortened version of the third-person VR video we used in our interprofessional course. Unfortunately, we can't demonstrate the full 3D VR effect without special goggles, but even in 2D it has some impact. Hey Jen. Hi. We have our radiation therapy student joining us for this treatment. Hello. This is Trina. Nice to meet you. Welcome. You ready to go for the next patient? Yeah.
lovely Hollywood script. And it all looks really good. Yes. For the rest of our time today, we would like to share our VR video experience with you. While our solution is specific to oncology, we believe that it may have broad applications across any number of disciplines, and may be of direct interest to you. Our goals for this session are to give you quick introductions to ourselves, radiation therapy, and how we use simulation-based education, to discuss VR video technology in general, to highlight some andragogy supporting the use of VR video, to discuss our experiences with VR, and to discuss our future plans. I'm Brian Chwill. I'm an instructor for the Radiation Therapy Program in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. A large part of my role is simulation-based education. So what is radiation therapy? Radiation therapy is the use of radiation to kill cancer cells while sparing as much normal tissue as possible. Along with chemotherapy and surgery, it is one of the three main cancer treatment modalities. Approximately 40% of cancer patients will have radiation therapy as part of their care. In a year, Alberta will see about 9,000 radiation therapy patients province-wide. Over 90% of radiation patients will be treated on large machines called linear accelerators or LINACs, which are pictured here. The others will be treated using more specialized machines or by placing radioactive sources directly in or on their body. Radiation therapy is a unique profession that requires a diverse blend of advanced knowledge in physics, oncology, and patient care. We work in an emotionally charged environment with patients who are undergoing life-altering events. Radiation therapists are responsible to safely deliver potentially lethal doses of radiation to their patients with a high level of technical precision, one millimeter in any direction. It is a potentially stressful career and is not for everyone. Hello everyone, my name is Jen Dewhurst. I'm an instructor in the undergraduate radiation therapy program within the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. I've come from a clinical teaching background and have now transitioned a large part of my role into simulation-based education. Simulation-based education is an educational technique that involves creating situations that replicate real life. These let the learner act as if they would do in real life and then provides feedback and debriefs the performance. Simulation is a learning tool which fits nicely into the constructivism model, which states that learners construct their meaning only through active engagement with the world, so things like experiments or real-world problem solving. High-fidelity simulation promotes student engagement and impacts knowledge acquisition, retention, and retrieval due to the experiential nature of it. So simulation is effective in many domains and has been found to be superior to traditional clinical education. It's a powerful educational intervention, which has been used effectively to develop student competency in a safe environment, which in turn maximizes hospital resources and supports patient safety on the floor. RADITH 410 is a special seminars course in interprofessional education hosted by Radiation Therapy, Dental Hygiene and Medical Laboratory Sciences. When this experience was first developed, the ideas of constructivism were very well integrated. Recognizing students within different professions would likely have less than even novice understanding in order to integrate basic principles. The experience was based in the physical space where students could interact and explore that full environment. This offered the physical immersion and a more developed foundational understanding of this profession. 
Once that space was no longer an option, we adapted by creating a presentation to give supplementary foundational experiences within radiation therapy. What we found though was that this adaptation did not deliver the emotional impact or the ability to actively explore the surroundings that being in the physical space did. To address some of these challenges, we explored a bit more into sociological and psychological fidelity, integrating social cognitive theory by Bandura. Bandura claimed that human learning occurs in a social environment and therefore is extremely context dependent. This framework utilizes modeling as a critical component for a learner to acquire changes in their behavior, knowledge, and attitudes. Psychological fidelity occurs when that simulation activity at most elicits an emotional response as if the experience was real. Social fidelity has often been discussed in terms of interprofessional education simulation activities looking to create interactions that affect the level of realism. So therefore, we pulled from our experience and knowledge of high fidelity simulation and created a more appropriate adaptation to share the role of radiation therapy. Developing an immersive experience within radiation therapy provides that opportunity to explore the physical space, but not be required to physically come to the hospital, but still experience that visceral impact of the equipment and of that physical space. I'm Cody Wesley, a designer with the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. I work for a group called Academic Technologies, and I have a background in both graphic design and physical product design. And in my role, I work to improve medical education by creating different types of tools to explain complex topics or integrate new technologies into the way that we train various clinicians. As a designer working in healthcare, I'm able to approach the problem from different lens than a clinician might. This allows us to ask different types of questions and open up what the actual problem might be. This can lead to creative and more impactful solutions that really target the user. So we started working with immersive video to improve and augment the in-person clinical education. Immersive video is shot with a special camera that records it in a panoramic view, either 180 degrees or 360 degrees. It allows the person watching the video to actually feel like they're entering that environment. Now these videos can be viewed on a virtual reality headset for the best immersion, or they can be looked at on a 2D computer screen um, where the viewer is able to pan and look around. Now what's special about these videos is being able to look around the video, you feel like you're a participant and that you're part of the environment. This provides the viewer with a sense of presence um, it virtually exposes them to a real world environment and it creates greater empathy by literally seeing from somebody else's perspective. Now we recorded the radiation therapy experience videos in two different ways. First, we created a first person perspective. And so to do this, we took a tripod with wheels on it and attached our Insta360 video uh, up above it, shooting at 180 degrees. The radiation therapist, Jen in this case, was able to push the tripod in front of her um, and the viewer was able to see directly from her perspective. So you're able to see her hands in front of the camera and able to look around at the areas she might be looking at while providing treatment to the patient. And so this really allows you to understand exactly what it's like for the radiation therapist um, as they're caring for their patient. The other video we shot is in a third person perspective. We wanted the viewer to feel as though they're a student that's observing. So we had Jen and Brian both addressing the camera as if it was a student, introducing the viewer to the space, and then shadowing Jen and Brian as they are caring for their patient. We hope that this could provide an alternative to clinical visits when they're not available. You can probably imagine that having Cody and the academic technologies team is quite an asset. And Jen and I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Because to be quite honest, when it comes to making videos, Jen and I really don't know what we're doing. The one thing that surprised us the most was probably the time and effort that ended up being required. We started out in the end of September with some visioning meetings with ActTech. Here, they tried to pull out of us what we teach and how we teach it. It took a few sit-downs for us to fully understand each other, but in the end, we were able to clearly define our problem and arrive at VR video as the solution. Then we moved into our brainstorming phase where Jen and I, under ACT Tech guidance, wrote scripts and produced crude storyboards. 
I personally found producing these to be quite challenging, but they certainly proved their worth by providing tangible documents of our vision for everyone in the team to refer to. In the end of October, our full team, including our actor, met on site and walked through the videos. Step by step and line by line, we figured out where the cameras would be, how to get high quality sound, where the actors would be standing, where they would be looking, and so on. It took a few of these walkthroughs before we felt ready to film. Then we filmed over two half days, and I for one quickly learned that acting isn't easy. You know, we were just filming a typical radiation therapy treatment, something I've done tens of thousands of times, but the minute the cameras were on, I forgot everything. It was so unnatural to think about where to stand and look and what line was next. It took quite a few takes before I became desensitized to this and things started looking natural again. Over two and a half days of filming, we finished with one hour of product, two takes of two 15 minute videos. Finally, there was post-production. Cody had to download all the recordings from the cameras and the audio from the boom mic. He synchronized the video and the audio, stitched together all our scenes and uploaded them to YouTube. Then we had other radiation therapy faculty review the videos for content accuracy. And when we were happy with that, Cody smoothed out the transitions, added titles, credits, and some branding. All told, our project lasted three full months. Now much of that time was a result of busy people trying to coordinate availability. And given a higher priority, we might have been able to finish a month or so quicker. But the lesson that we want to share with all of you is that producing high quality video is labor intensive and takes some time. Although the student feedback from the addition of this video has not been fully reviewed, anecdotally an early review of the responses does show that students valued the video and that they did appreciate much more of what radiation therapy is all about, including a much better perspective of what the patient has been through and experienced along their patient journey. After our experiences, we are now starting to consider how we can expand the use of these tools into other core courses, which are often preclinical and can lack fulsome understanding of their profession. If we're able to offer a stronger foundational understanding of the role of the therapist, the experience of the patient, and the environment, we would hope to better support some of our early students' development from novice to experts. In turn, we could support the depth and integration of content earlier and more confidently for the student, which creates even more opportunities within the program. We've also begun to think about how we can use this in other ways. So example challenges we've had with recruitment. How do we promote a profession which is often fully unknown and access and distance is an issue? This tool could certainly be useful to better support the description and exploration of radiation therapy for those potential students as well. On behalf of the three amigos, I would just like to thank you for spending your time with us. We hope that it sparks some curiosity and how you might benefit from exploring these types of tools within your program.